Welcome to the Aiki Dojo podcast. I am David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center of Los Angeles, and with me is... Bill D'Angelo, Aikido Fourth Don, Aikido Center of Los Angeles. And we have a special guest. Andrew Blevins. Uh, I'm Chief Instructor of Kiru Aikido out of Colorado and uh, California here. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to see you. And uh, you started doing Aikido in 1985? Correct. Yeah, 1985, I started um, doing Tomiki style um, Aikido for my first six years um, from a, a non-combative or non-sport version of Tomiki style. So, that is that even a thing? It like, is. It is the non-combative, non-competitive, non-sport style of Tomiki. It is. It tomiki is. is kind of known for its combative slash com- com- competitive competitive style. style yes and the the master of that style was his name was carl geis um my my teacher was scott sensei um but um i i i didn't necessarily i didn't know what i was looking for when i was i was 15 years old or whatever when i started so um i think i just fell into it by luck and i think it was a nice version of tomiki in this in the fact that you know they weren't really focused on you know, getting points and, but there were, there, it was very judo focused and there was a lot of falls and a lot of, um, how to, um, how to protect yourself from harder versions of falls. And so I think that was a nice foundation of, uh, keeping me healthy for the last, you know, 35 years or so. So, so how would you say, uh, Tomiki style compares to Aikikai? You had to compare and contrast them. Um, yeah, I, I would say it's very, um, um, very, um, regulated, you know, they had, you know, now we, you know, and I, you know, and Aikikai or Aikikasa, I would call it, you know, uh, I think you would say, you know, Shomunichi Ikkyo or Ikotekaish or whatever, but they have a number one, number two, number three, number four, up to 17, you know, like the basic, almost the kata. And so their techniques were kataized, I guess you would call it. So Kodagaisha, I don't know, it was 12 or something. So, um, but it was very... Pretty set. Pretty set. I, I would say it's almost like a kendo version of, you know, men, kote, you know, kind of this. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. It was really interesting. So I was reading in, on your website about how you talk about Ukemi being an integral practice in, in the way you teach and, and explain Aikido. Did did part of how you developed your sense of Ukemi come from your early training in Tamiki style Aikido? Yeah, yeah. And now I think that was if if anything I brought into my Aikido, even in traditional Aikido we were talking about, um, is the the Ukemi and being very precise and being very um um Techn- technical about it in the sense of how I fell and how my body um, is positioned when I fall and how you tuck your chin and how you slap at 45 degrees and all that kind of stuff. And again, not that I, it was technical in that sense, but it really taught that once you do that a thousand times a certain way and you take a hard fall, then your body slaps at 45 degrees and your feet don't hit each other and your head, your head's tucked. And, um, you know, we were talking about that on the drive up about, um, you know, I think that really is a nice foundation to Aikido in general of staying healthy. We do 50% ukemi, right? So right, for sure. It's nice to have a, a, um, a foundation in that a little bit. But, yeah, it's a good question. And then from there, you went to what style of Aikido? Uh, I call it traditional style, um, but uh, it was a dojo named uh, Nippon Kan, and it was in Denver. Um, uh, he was the last, uh, Uchideshi of Osensei. I think he was there the last few years of his, um, life. And, um, I would say it's very flavored with, uh, Iwama style type techniques and, uh, weapons as well. So I, I call it traditional style, but I don't know how else you'd say it. Cause Osensei retired to Iwama from from Aikikai in Tokyo, mm-hmm. and that's where he, he, he trained with him in Iwama um, for the last few years there, and then moved to uh, Colorado um, there. So, and then I joined early '90s there. So, when they talk about like this idea of Osensei 
leaving um, the Shinjuku Dojo and going to Iwama, but then now they call it, they have like the separation of powers, so so to speak. You have Aikikai, which is technically Shinjuku, and Iwama, which is you no know, Ibaraki Dojo, but Aiki Shrine. Mm-hmm. So I wonder how those two th- became separated. Yeah, it was very interesting. I was actually just reading um, O Sensei's uh, one of O Sensei, a, a book about O Sensei. Um, it was translated by Yazao Sensei. Um, I was just kind of really digging into that recently, and I think the found the the Hambu Dojo was actually in Awama for a while, and then at at a certain point they there was probably some reasons about that, but then they moved it back to Shinjuku. So I think it's been both, um, but. Your question is what? What's the difference between the two? Or well, there's a there's now Iwama style mm-hmm. and the Aiki quote unquote Aiki Kai style. Mm-hmm. You know, Tomiki Key Society. You know, so on and so forth. But then, like, there's a difference now between Iwama. I mean, there's similarities, but there are differences between Iwama and uh, Aiki Kai. Yeah, and and uh, you know, my teacher really talked a lot about you know the um, a lot to do with how Iwama was really focused a lot more on the weapons. And um, during the post-war era, when the the uh, Americans kind of came over, they kind of said no martial arts for a while. Right. And Osensei is out in the farm. And um, if you actually look at like Iwama Bokens, for example, they actually are, you know, yeah, shaped as an, stout. Uh, and almost like a hoe handle. And so <laughs> he would say if they came by, like, these are just... These are just Farm farming implements, and yeah. so um, it's uh, it's a really interesting way that they were able to be out in the middle of nowhere and practice and focus on that practice. And while um, you know, um, I don't even know if they were able to practice for a while in in Tokyo, but um, but I think that's kind of where it kind of branched a little bit, and and maybe uh, different maybe ideas of. Um, you know, like, for example, you know, maybe in Aikikai, you can't take brick falls and maybe, you know, because make it make too much noise. Or like I said, I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying, for example, but and not, and not as many weapons because they couldn't practice weapons for a long time. Um, and then there's, you know, not as much room up there as well. You know, there's no outdoor place nearby that I've seen. But When Furu Sensei was there in 69, uh, Saito Sensei was there teaching weapons at the same time. And Aikikai? Yeah, Aikikai. Yeah, yeah, and so I, I think there were some in there. Like I said, I'm you know I don't know all the details of the uh, Shinjuku, you mm-hmm. know the Shibuya stuff, but um, definitely uh, it's interesting how they branched. Um, but we were talking, you know, about you know what is traditional Aikido, and you know you really can see lots of interesting differences. But when you practice, I think there's a lot of similarities as well. So. Well, I mean, today, do you think that Aikido with weapons? See, in the old days it was Aikido with key and Aikido without key. Nowadays it's more Aikido with weapons, Aikido without weapons, and Aikido with weird weapons. <laughs> you know, people are just. Oh, making, non, non Aikido style. Well, you know, I got, my, I got a 51 Joe kata that I've been learning. <laughs> you know, I got an 8 Joe kata that I, you know, you go, whoa, where, where do all these Joe katas come from? Yeah, definitely. I've you know seen some interesting stuff over the years, um, but I think if you actually look at weapons, especially weapons from my perspective, I think you can see very distinct groups of styles. I, you know, for for um, some are very you know I would say um, based off of true, maybe more or not true, but more sword based. You know, and 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 you know and. Iwama style has a very unique flavor to it as well. Um, and they're, you know, you know, for example, like the man where they go all the way back to almost touching their back and, you know, how, you know, furikaburi and all those kind of things that each one does. But, um, and then Homa Sensei and Nippon Kan style was very, uh, um, very related to weapons, how it relates directly to Aikido techniques. And he called those riai or our, relations and uh, we had a s- set of relations but instead of having uh, like a number one number two number three number four um, he broke those into I would say puzzle pieces I call it um, where you have a start an entry just like in Aikido um, those were called shinogis so like a wase shinogi or uchiotoshi shinogi or these are kind of 
initiates to or how to respond to openings or uh, initial attacks. Then there was the middles, just like in Aikido, where we have kukuri, as we call them, um, where just like, you know, Idiminage, where you come in and you move in, like you have to move their body and you come through, just like in a lot of the sword practice where maybe they came to your wrist or broke your wrist with a jo. Um And then at the end, just like Aikido techniques, then there was the finishing, which we call the sabaki. So menuchi sabaki or makuchi ski sabaki or different ways that relate to different techniques. And the cool thing is that the, the different middles, just like an open hand, and the different entries all can relate to almost any Aikido. Um, and then you can relate to why why do we do those different techniques? And it's based off of, of course, responses from some, some type of attack or, or movement. Um, but also, do I want to end up facing this way or do I want to check my behind and make sure that I'm always including multiple attack Scenario. martialness? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what did you say? No, no, I was going to say, I said scenarios. I was just saying, like, when you're looking front, back, side. Exactly. And, and always, in a martial way, always keeping your eyes open to things you can't see. So it, it's always best to do ura if you can, to make sure you check your behind, you know. It, it's always, you know, as we come in, you know, I can always see behind me, in front of me. So you, always, you can't always see what's back here. So, so uh, why did you uh, change styles of Aikido? Uh, from Tomiki? Yeah. Uh, actually, my, my sensei died from uh, cancer, and it was, uh, you know, he had some problems for a while, and um, yeah, definitely, I think it, it wasn't a huge group. It was probably 10, 15 people, um, and I was pretty young to the Aikido world, and so um, uh, definitely it was hard of that, and as well as um, switching styles is a little bit of a uh, jarring mm -hmm. thing. And um, I, I have an interesting story about that is that, you know, I actually was a defined, just got my black belt in Tomiki style. And I went to the new school, just to imagine me coming here and coming to practice. And so, you know, a totally different style. And the worst thing I could do is probably come in as a black belt, right? And in so the, in the 90s. Yeah. In the 90s, in the, yeah. Today, you go, hey, buddy. Yeah. Hey, buddy, let me do Well, I, I, I meant that in a good way. The worst thing I could have done. And so it was it was actually very um, interesting. And I don't know how it happened, and I don't remember the story of how it happened, but Homo Sensei gave me the opportunity. He said, you can keep your black belt or you can start over as a white belt. I don't remember the conversation. <laughs> I just remember the opportunity, and I said, this is the awesomest thing ever. And I put on a white belt, the happiest person I've ever been and came started in with over. a fresh and started over from zero Q. And, and it was a beautiful thing, you know, in the sense of Shoshinsha and put on the white belt and I could be free. And, you know, just I would love, learn. I would love to put on a white belt today. It's just, it's a nice feeling of that. I would love to put on a white belt too. Exactly. Just so I wouldn't have the responsibility as a teacher. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, in a, in a good way and a bad way. Like I said, it's it's our responsibility at a certain point that we need to. We talked about you know driving on culture and driving on the experiences we've had, but at that time it was a perfect opportunity where I had a nice break. They gave me the opportunity. I started over as a white belt, and of course, you know, when you're nikyoing all their black belts and all that kind of stuff, and they're like. Okay, maybe we need to promote them just in case, so we don't want to, you know, make people look. I'm joking around, but I'm yeah. Joking around, but. <clears throat> so, what what did you find is the biggest difference? Definitely the style. Definitely the the techniques. Definitely techniques, because the other uh, Tomiki style was very linear, very um, one, two, three, four versus we're going to work on Chominuchi today. But did you? But did the basic techniques carry over, like Shihonage, Kodagaishi, um, you know, corner drop? I mean, did did the basics? Um, I would say yes. Yeah. You did. Uh, that, I, would, I would say yes in the sense that from my perspective at a very only six years of training there, I would say that because they were so regimented and they only had one way of doing it, version, maybe there was two numbers of one that had a mote nuda, but I would say it truly it wasn't, uh, I, I felt like it wasn't broad enough. Mm. And so I think just like I was saying about the relations of weapons to open hand, um, I felt like, you know, I think you're kind of stuck 
if, if, if somebody attacks you and you say, I need to only number 12, you're like, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> or if somebody attacks me, my first thing is I got to get out of the way and move my hand up. Right. Or not, you think about it, but you, you do that versus you respond and then you've done 300 of this movement. So then your body does this thing next. But I think, uh, again, in my limited time at that point, I thought that was a hard thing. And I think it was such a nice thing for me to flush. And what I really kept, I think, was the ukemi. Yeah. Yeah, I really kept the Okimi. Yeah. What was the what was the biggest surprise to you? Um, let's see. That's a good that's a really good question. Um, surprise? I was I, I was actually surprised in a happy way that it was much harder training and was much more um martial in the, at least at that dojo. Mm. Um, I was very surprised, you know, how depth the weapons were, and I really enjoyed that, so I never missed the weapons class. Um, and uh, um, and I just really enjoyed, you know, getting tossed around and getting beat up and all that kind of stuff, so it was kind of fun. So you became Homa Sensei's main uchideshi? I was never uchideshi. I, never li- I was never a living student. I would say I was a soto deshi, always a soto deshi, but I lived nearby, and I went seven days a week type of, you know, go to, go to school or go to training all the time. But, um, I would say first few years I kind of, you know, slowly, you know, just was a student and I was able to train and, you know, and I I would say Homa Sensei probably promoted me pretty quick. Um, and I always, I felt promotions were, uh, an unfortunate thing. Like, oh, you know, I'm going to be the best EQ on the planet. And so, or Sankyu on the planet. And so you're like, okay, I got promoted Sankyu, so I'm going to be the best Sankyu on the planet. And then you keep training and training, training, training. And then he puts you on, and if you get tra- you get promoted to Aniki, you're like, wait, I, I have not became the best Sankyu on the planet yet, so you can't, you know, it's kind of that, okay, it's that always, okay, now I need to. So you felt a lot of drive. Yeah, I loved it, yeah. And I, and I, I, drive is a good a good one. And then I never felt like it just was the next, some people, I think, you know, you might think I get ranked and you're like, oh, kind of thing. But versus I rank, oh, man, now I got to be the best at that. And really, and I'm, it's going too fast. I, it's like when, as we get older, we only have so much time. Like, I, I got I got to get fit more in. And so it was kind of a challenge. And um, I thought in a, in a good way, like, how do I make proud of this? How do I live up to this, this whatever the teachers have put on to me as a, as a, as a student, I guess. So what was it like deshing for Homa Sensei? Because, I mean, you're one review from Homa Sensei. I, I, I think, um, I, I think one of the reasons why I really enjoy talking to you and talking to your, you know, Furuya Sensei students is I see, I feel a lot of that traditional flow. And one of the things of being with Homa Sensei, um, you know, he was very traditional and very strict and very, um, there was a lot going on in there. And I think in his own way, I think he had his own um, very um, strong uh, take and, um, making his own version of what he've learned, of course. You know, I think everybody has to take their own um, while keeping the traditional sense. Oh, yeah, it was like being dish. I, I thought it was I thought it was great. And then I kind of think of it as like, because I travel with him over, we went to all over the world, we went to Brazil and Czechoslovakia and places. And, yeah, a lot of times I was his otomo. And, you know, his main kind of brought, carried his bag and, was there. And I think that part of that to me was a biggest lesson of how to be a good student and how do you know, and it also it, how to be a good uke. Cause the uke, you know, I, you know, I was talking about this earlier, an uke when you're an uke and you've been your sensei's uke in a deshi, um, you know, there would be a lot of times in class, your sensei would be doing something and they, they would just kind of go like that and they'd look over, right? And maybe I would be lined into the weapons rack and I'd grab a Vulcan and then an attack. Like, and people were like, what did you, did you guys work that out ahead of time? Like, no, I just know from 
35 times have done that we're doing this and then we're going to do this today, you know, and how do you know you're doing Menuchi? Like, cause you know, maybe this or, you know, whatever, like, how do you anticipate and how do you anticipate sensei needs a drink of water? Sensei needs this. Should I be dilly dallying in the locker room and, or should I be dressed in ahead of time, have his hakama folded and before he's already leaving the building, I think that was an amazing training experience, you know. But that, uh, do you think that training is possible today? Sure, yeah. yeah. Is it possible? Like, um, how, possible in the sense of how do you learn it or how do you Well, the, the aspirations it? of the student to fold the teacher's hakama, to know what the teacher wants before the teacher wants it type thing. You know, like the, you know, the guy who played um, the Zatoichi, Mm -hmm. He, had, he if you watch his documentary, he talks about the cigarette comes up, it must be lit by the time it, his fingers come up like this, yeah. and you have to put the lit cigarette in his hand, and he goes, <sighs> he can't go here, and then right. you put the cigarette in, and then light it, you get all that, you get in trouble, and this is acting, right? But today, for the student, for you to go like this, and then the student puts the lit cigarette, and you, <sighs> and you smoke it, for one, they'd be like, oh my God, you're smoking, and you'd be chastised for that, but that level of, of uh, awareness, sensitivity, is it, do you think it's possible to teach that today? I, I think it is learned, personally, and I think it is taught. And did, I, did you get in trouble if you didn't do the right thing at the right time? Uh, definitely. How did you get, what, what, did they, what did he do? Uh, he would either be in a bad mood or he might yell at me or, or just might be disappointed. What's worse? I mean, being disappointed and just kind of, oh, yeah, okay, he messed up. Like, that's even worse. Like... But I would say, from a learning perspective, I, for maybe it's just my personality, is I like try to. I definitely made lots of mistakes in my time. You know, I, I can even tell you times like I kicked out and got joined the next day and stuff. So you know that kind of stuff, but not in a bad way. Like everybody, we all make mistakes, and so we, I think we learn from those mistakes. But I think it can be. I can. I think it can be learned. Like I think. If, if we're, we're having a partnership here and a senpai kohai thing and I say, hey, you know, that was interesting today when you took, took the last slice of pizza from sensei. Like, you know, do you think that was maybe the best? And maybe sensei didn't yell at him. Like, you know, and maybe – and you could yell at him and you could say that was a terrible thing to do. Or you can say, you know what, think about sensei. He comes down every day. This is his time. You know, do, do you – regardless of if he wants that last piece of last piece of food do you maybe just leave it for him you know just kind of talking through that I, I, I but people might be more sensitive nowadays and maybe that's hard but well today it's the i'm hungry i eat and so we have to let them eat yeah. as opposed to you have to you know in your like hold back your own desires and not take that last dumpling not take that mm -hmm. last piece of pizza because it's it's bad etiquette mm -hmm. right like in japanese they have a saying like the the person who takes the last piece is a glutton. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to be known as a glutton. But then the thing is that if you're in a group with your entire school and there's food left on the table, they, the, the junior is the person who eats all the food or drinks all the alcohol. So there's no more tai and I. Mm -hmm. There's no waste. Yeah. But then like there's this whole idea like that one dumpling, yeah, that one slice of pizza, it, that thing that, that you look at and you think, I, I really want that because I'm hungry. Right. But then if you reach for it and take it, yes. That's bad. Yeah. But then you can't, how do you teach that today to people who go, well, I'm hungry. When I'm hungry, I eat. Well, I'll just buy another pizza then for you, sensei. What would you, what would you say? I mean, I, I, that's a good question. I, I, I have an answer to that, but um, can you teach that? I, can you teach it? I think that um, it's, it's teachable, but it's difficult. I think it's difficult. I think that some people want to sign up for that process and some people are less interested in that part of the training. But that's the real training. Yeah. 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 And and I would and I, I think that's a really unique point of view. And I would say to both of you, I would say my fr I think there has to be an initial a bare minimum of respect that has to be done. And that's yeah, where that's, that's where the, the, the lessons come in. And so you're gonna say, Yeah, don't don't do these things and you have to this is a traditional dojo. Let's wait for sensei to have his drink first. Let's Let's uh, let's yeah. get a plate for sensei before and and guests and things like that, but then then it comes down to those little higher level things like go get his gi, go get his thing, hakama. But you can train that. I think you can say you're becoming a Q now. 
make sure to go get Sensei's Hakama. You know, there's a guest today. Do you got their Hakama? Do you have their thing? Are they doing, do they need any water? Like teach them to start, like, how do you, how do you be, how, like, oh, Sensei, like, or those, you know, things, how do you, how do you know things before ha- they, they happen until you train people to do that? But I, I mean, do you know how to train people to do that? I, I think I do. I think you just continue to be. Con- I, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm this great person. I'm saying that I think you just continue to be consistent and you always follow through every single time. You might be a broken record. Let's say that's m- maybe not the best way, but eventually they they realize like, okay, so this is gonna get on me about this, you know, and not in a bad way. Like I'm a pretty nice guy. Like you know, I you know I'm not. I don't feel like. You know, I think we've learned, we learned from our upbringing that there's different ways to approach lessons. Blevinson said, do you, does your um, school spend time outside of the the class so that there's, there's experiences such as dinners or activities where that kind of interaction can get further developed? Uh, because like, I think what Ito Sensei was saying is a lot of times those experiences where the training really comes into effect is not necessarily on the mat potlucks and going out to yeah to lunches and dinners and having things yeah and going to seminars and going to other schools together i would say yes you know in the last many years especially not having such a big dojo um that we try traveled more to other dojos and we um you know when we were, we used to before the pandemic we used to um test with uh, zawa sensei and their group so we would go to test with them so there's there's a whole opportunity there right do you then do my top students make sure that his house and say his stuff is taken care of as much as we can it's none of you know it's not it's their students as well as but then we might go to have dim sum or something afterwards and and again where do you sit you know how do you you know wait for people to sit down you know how do we get fed how do you you know especially going to training with other places you know is is your, you know, people's gi, are you carrying their weapons? Are you, yeah. But not, I would say, as much as um, as I did in when it was a more traditional dojo. And uh, I just, you know, was able to share. I, it's one of my favorite books. Um, it's called 365 Days in the Dojo. But it's it's really interesting. It was Homo Sensei's book. And it was about all the different days in the dojo that provide you different opportunities to to learn to learn culture and learn these lessons through a different tool but the same lessons like dojo um dojo day where you might go out to the park and plant trees like we did that in homeless essays you know and they he he fed the homeless every month right and so uh and then um you know keiko hajime keiko same you know, this is a Keiko Osame, the only day that you clean the dojo, right? No, right? right? So, but it's a day you clean the dojo and you make a big deal about why it's so important that the dojo is cleaned. And so how, why are those 365 days, there's not 365, but why are those, all those different opportunities and opportunity? We were talking about this earlier of how do we teach culture? Right. And how do we teach, how do we, we can focus on the people that are maybe doing strange things, but then we can also say, let's more focus on, every single one of these opportunities where we can share our understanding of culture and our understanding of martials other than just martials, martial practice. Right. And that's, that's a great question. You know, how do, how do we, how do we have opportunities to learn culture? Right. Well, but it seems like today that if I don't tell them what to do right before we do it, they can't do it. So like, would you say that the good students that are very perceptive don't start to realize that after the third time or fourth time that 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 now they start to no because they they do you yeah, think you it's a mindset to, that that you're you not ready? To, hey, to, this is what we're doing today. Hey, you guys. Hey, make sure this gets done today. And if I go if I, if I forget, I look over. And, oh, it didn't get done. And then you just go yeah. mm. as the teacher, you just have to look away and go. Can't say anything because you yeah. know they're. You know, but so that's the thing is like, I don't even know if it's possible to teach people today that because of every day I go, hey guys, hey everybody. You know, I jokingly say this is the thing. I go, hey, everybody got to flush the toilet today, all right? 
I mean, I don't say it to the students, but I say it to the assistant. They go, why do I have to tell you how to flush the toilet? Right. It should be obvious. It yeah. should be a tidy maya. That this thing comes after right. this thing. And, right. and so today I don't really know. So I go, oh. But did you did you learn that because you were told that or did you learn that because eventually you thought that that, I did, that this is an important thing to do? I did not deshi as close as Watanabe Sensei, but I still deshied. Right. And so I just learned, oh, this is how you this is how you negotiate yourself. Yeah. Right. You know, like today I go, hey, what are you guys doing? And they go, oh, I, I'm busy today. And you go, oh, I, OK, I understand. And then you have to just you go at it, you know, because the traditional way is very difficult for people. And like my, I have this thing where I talked about before where I say people can only do tr um, stressful traditional training for 10 years. Because after 10 years is where they where they, they a lot of them meet their breaking point. But you did it for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. I did it for over mm -hmm. 10 years. But today, when I look back, all the people that did it for, usually right around the 10th year, they go, they go right. hit the toilet and you go, oh, pushed them too far. Yeah. And then the, the best one is now they call me up and they go, oh, I dash you for this person now. And they, they think I'm great. And I go, oh, I use all the stuff you told me, Sensei. And I go, oh. <laughs> great. Good. So it's, great. It's well, I'm glad that, uh, that that's... The, the, that that teacher is benefiting from the, right. the my labor, right. and they go, oh yeah, he's so much better than you now. And you go, <laughs> and you just go, oh, oh okay. Yeah. Or they, or yeah. I get a call from another teacher saying, oh, your student that came over here, wow, that person's so good. And I go, yeah, yeah. I I, I take that in two ways. That, that's actually a really inter interesting point. And you know, I you know, especially after I left Nippon Kan, um, there's there's a number of senseis who I really respect and look up to. And so um, one of them is a Hendrix, a Patricia Hendrix sensei, um, and she's Iwama style now, Aikikai, but she's still Iwama style um, and in the, in the t technical sense. But I sent uh, Kara-san, one of my students, to her as a Nuchi Deshi. And, and it was very interesting because I knew Hendrix sensei from before. But one of the things, even recently, we had a discussion recently, she was, I knew, I knew what a good sensei her sensei was when her she came here and she didn't have to be asked to do things and she was very proactive and open minded to learning and being a good deshi, and and they I think senseis know, regardless of going to another dojo and leaving completely. But what I'm saying is, that is a good symbol for us as deshi or as senseis of when our students go to other places and then those senseis call back and say, thank you for sending those people. I appreciated their due diligence and, and, and spirit as well. Um, and I think that's a lot of times if you send people to other dojos, right, you want to send people that are going to display those characteristics over there and then you may reward them. You know, that's, you know, when Homo sensei was building a relationship with Saito sensei, you know, he, he said, okay, I'm going to send somebody to Iwama. And so he said, say, okay, Andrew, can you go to, will you go to Iwama for a short time? Right. But he didn't send anybody. He sent somebody who he says, and of course, you know, there was this, okay, make sure here's 10 things that no matter what, here's 10 things. Of course I knew because right. I was a deshi, but you don't, you're not going to send somebody who's going to make 10 mistakes, right? You're going to send somebody who's ultimately building a bridge through that. But the thing is that the reason why you're, they, he sent you is not because you're the best or you know the 10 things to do, is that you care enough. That, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, you have to care enough to want to put out the best quality thing, whichever that thing is. You go, oh, so you... Let, Attentive to those, those yeah. things that we think are important. Because you're gonna, yeah. everyone's going to make mistakes. But yeah. it's, a, it's a how many times... So it's like this idea of uh, how many times must you be told once. Right. How many times when you get better should you be told? None times. Right. Because you should be smart enough to see it, other people do it, and then not do it yourself. Right. And then and then the third stage. Yeah. So which gotta, is then you preemptively yeah. make sure and I and I have great um experiences here, for example. I remember when we came to your uh, seminar a long time ago with this house sensei, and you show up and you go into our, our, our hotel and there's a nice basket with some water and fruit and things like that. And that was, that was a subtle thing, but that's a, that's a very important, that was, you know, that was a really cool thing. That, that's what I'm saying. You were preemptively know yeah. that 
these people may need some water and some fruit while you're training. And these people are coming to train with us. And that was, that was, yeah. I, and it's just like Aikido, right? Octo no sen, somebody attacks you, you respond, right? Before, eventually you get to the point where I, this is something weird. This person's a little strange. Are they going to hit me? I don't know. But kind of keep your awareness. So that's, you know, send no send, right? Or whatever. Like, how do you, I think, how do you, you kind of like, how do you train that? I think ultimately being a good deshi, being a good uke, and being a good deshi or otomo. I mean, deshi in the sense of like a, a attendant or. Yeah. I think all of those <clears throat> are teaching us to be good Aikido students, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, and so can it be trained? I think it can, but ultimately the level, and you said there has to be a bare minimum. Yeah. Bill son. But I think also on the other side that when you go to the higher levels, there has to be some type of contract, uh, a, a nonverbal contract. Do you really want to be my higher level student? Right. Right. So here's the, some of the things that you need to start thinking about. And that's their job to perform or not, you know? So now, um, when did you strike out on your own? Um, early 2000, so like 2003, 2004. Yeah, and, and that's when I started Kira Aikido. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so almost 20 years. And was that in Colorado or in, that was in, or Colorado. in Cal- California? Yeah, Colorado. I just moved to California about six years ago, five or six years ago. So that was in Colorado, and I started uh, started on my school on my own, and... I think, like you said, you know, I, I we had very similar um, backgrounds, but again, I I, I left, and you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, you guys had a you know different situation that you know happened. So, what was it like that first year? Um, as a new dojo, mm, I I think it was a good thing. I think it was uh, um becoming a white belt in, in a different way, right? So um, at, at Nippon Khan at that time, you know, we had probably had, I don't know, 180, 200 students, and we had, I don't know, 15 teachers or something. I don't know, 10 teachers or something. So, and, you know, I was the chief instructor. So I think there's a different mindset and different things you're worried about and things you're worried about. But when you become your own, you're like, I got to market and I got to get awareness out there. And then, how you know, what is... How do I keep culture and how do I keep um, how do I keep that same thread of the most important things so that when we practice that we're keeping those those most important things and then what did I learn in the many years of you know I, I think of misogi of shaving the shaving the badness off of maybe there's some negative things that I learned or things that I didn't like about my experience and so how do I remove those while keeping the four core fundamentals of culture and Aikido? So I didn't dilute it and focus on what is there. So I think that was the hardest thing of keeping, keeping, keeping the mindset of a strong culture while not having a giant dojo of hundred students, you know, mm, you know, and you're kind of like, which is fine, right? It's, it's a good thing, right? It's a good misogi too. Of you know, and a lot of uh, a you know a number of the students that were very close to me came with me and and come came with me to train. So, how many was that? Mm, probably about five, five, seven of them. Yeah, and again, I didn't ask. I just you know, I'm people chose to. It was an interesting thing. So you were thirty three then. Mm, something like that. Yeah, twenty almost twenty years ago. So thirty ish. Yeah. So now that you're in your year 50. Yeah, was, yesterday. Would you, was it yesterday? Or a few days ago. Yeah. Wow, happy would, birthday. Thank you, thank you. Would you do it again? Do what? Would you start, would you start from scratch again now that you're 50? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you, what, what, is the, what is my two choices? Well, no, I was just like if you said, like you go, hey, I had to start this whole shebang bang all over again 20 years later. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my 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 choice is I can stop practicing or I can practice. I got two choices, <laughs> in my opinion. This is a, now, again, keeping culture, and again, I can. And then my second choice is: Can I do I want to teach, or do I want to go to another dojo? 
Right. And then the third choice is, like you said, if you're going to go to another dojo, it has to be somebody, especially after 30 years or 40, 50 years of experience or whatever, or at that point, I would think it was 20 years experience or something. It has to be something that I feel that this is um, a, a path that I feel that I want to dedicate my, if, if I call somebody a sensei or, or even a strong senpai, that, that. Uh, I, that they're a great teacher that I want to follow and, you know, that I do. And so I probably went to lots of different dojos and tried to train with different people, and I still do. But, again, there's that, is it is it my style and is it me? And is it the same um, things that I think are important as a... So what does the 2023 Kyuru Aikido look like? Uh, that's a good question. So it looked like as in what what are what is it turning into? Uh, I am more committed right now to um, how to go back to fundamentals and how to even more share technical Aikido in the sense of through strong fundamentals and strong weapons and strong um, foundational principles. And so and so that's that's what it, it means to me because we're kind of all starting over a little bit, I would say, in the world a little bit. And so when I go in and say, oh, if I want to teach like what, what, you know, what is what is the most important thing, you know, as we're bringing new students in, right? A lot of, you know, we lost, a lot of people lost a lot of students, right? So when you bring in these new people in, what is how do, what is the path? to that transformational journey as an Aikidoist and how do we keep that cultural and strong foundation strong. So that's kind of what I'm focusing on. I don't so, know if that's a good answer. No, it's, it's a good answer. <clears throat> but I mean, so who, who are you influenced by today? Um, I would say everybody that I train with. And um, I, I, I was thinking about this recently, you know, Everybody I train with and I go to try to train with, um, especially people I respect, I, I'm not going to learn their style in one night. Go to a yeah. seminar. I'm not going to become an expert. But is there one foundational principle or one thing that I can learn from that experience? And so, um, you know, definitely um, I'm looking for opportunities to work and train with people that have been experienced like, you know, for a long amount of time. Um, and, um, I have a lot of people I respect as senpai and, and, um, and so, uh, you know, I train with the Zawa sensei. Uh, I, I like to go to other seminars. Um, we just went to train with Hendrick sensei. Um, we train with them once in a while cause they're nearby and how, how far are they from you? Uh, San Leandro. So they're three hours, three and a half hours. So train with them, uh, definitely very similar styles. So. Um, do you see it different? Do you see that she is doing it the same or differently than uh, Saito Sensei? I wouldn't. I wouldn't know enough to compare the two, but I would say it's it's from my limited point of view. Uh, it's it's she's carrying on the lineage of uh, the principles and the ideas of Saito Sensei. Yeah. Is she close to uh, Saito Sensei's son? I would say they're very similar, yeah. No, I mean, is she, uh, do they have a relationship? I, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm sure they, I, I'm sure they keep in contact. I mean, I think they, I think she was a new dish there a long time with him, so I think they, they do have some type of relationship, but I'm not sure. That's a good question. Hmm. Um, but, you know, she's Ike guy now, so. Yeah. So I definitely, but it, the really cool thing is she's very respectful of Ike guy and she's very respectful of um, other styles, but she also, like we've been talking about how do you carry on your tradition and your lessons and, and learning for the past X number of years. Like Furia Sensei, you, you, you definitely can, I, in my opinion, you definitely can learn from other Aikidoists as a Furia Sensei student, but then you're also carrying on the tradition and the culture. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing, I think. I think that's a really cool thing. The hardest part for me, though, is like there's so few really good people out there. Or any person I come into contact with is wants to me to join so that they can utilize me 
And then I go, well, but I just want to. You're talking it from an organizational perspective? Not necessarily. Okay. Just like, you know, you meet a person and you go, oh, this would be interesting. Oh, gosh, all they want is my dollars, my students, my whatever it is. And you know, I know things. So it's so hard to find quality people of any style, any, any style of martial arts, including Aikido. Out right. There. Yeah, and I would say uh, when you find those people, then those people are, are even, it's even more of a gem. And more of a, um, more of, because I think, I think martial arts are slowly. Degrading. It's slowly going into the ether, right? And so because of that, there's less and less people and more and more people are coming up with ideas and, and of their own or they're changing things. And they're so, that, that's why cultural, and why I say culture, I mean, you know, technical foundational principles you know, lessons that they've learned, you know, kind of the Furia Foundation and things that you guys are doing. Why, you know, do, I, why do you think martial arts are suffering um, as a whole, like the the, con, the the group of martial arts? Yeah, I don't mean it in like a, a, a micro thing. I think in more of a meta thing. I think it's, yeah, I uh, I think, let me, let me think about this for a second, but I, I feel it's kind of what you're talking about of how, there's less and less people that are appreciative of that. And to, to really deep dive deep, there has to be appreciation of, um, tradition. And I also think there also has to be, um, I also, I, I don't know the word, but I think like, or the way to put it, but how do we, we're from different styles. Right, and you invited me to come down to teach. I thought that was that was a really cool thing. So I think that's one way. I'm not probably exactly your style, and you're not my style, but we both can I think appreciate each other's to us, even if it's one thing we can appreciate each other, and the more we can do something like that, and figure out ways to connect with those few people that maybe are really truly um, still here and have those lessons to give us, then. Um, I think we can hold on to it as much as possible. But I think right now, like, everybody is doing their own thing. And well, that fracturedness is what hurts yeah. traditional martial arts of all styles. Right, right. And and so, and what's a style at, at this point? You know, is it is it your certificate on the wall? Or well, but it, I mean, even yeah. karate, judo, aikido, all styles. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if... You almost have to, all styles have to band together to help each other in order for them all to succeed as opposed to Aikido with Aikido, Karate with Karate, Judo with Judo, that they all have to kind of come together somehow to bring traditional martial arts back to life. But how do you, how do we do that? And Sensei didn't, didn't, um, I mean, O Sensei and um, Kano Sensei, they, I mean, they all had this idea too, right, about preserving martial culture. I mean, that was... Yeah, but that's... We, we're talking at people at the highest level, and there's like five of them. We're talking... Now we have like 500,000 of them, and we're all like... You, you go say you go sensei, and they all go, yes? Mm -hmm. You know, because they're, they're all the senseis. They're all these people yeah. that you think, how does this person... You know, it's the death of the expert. Right. The person who runs through the ranks and gets like sixth on in 20 years, is that person a, technically an expert? Right. Today, yes, right? I was I was looking at a friend's LinkedIn account, mm -hmm. and this person is a, a, a television uh, producer, and they're like, a 10 years experience. This person is an expert in their field. And you go, whoa. In martial arts, 10 years means nothing. 20 years, meh, 30 years is when you go. That's where it really starts to become right, an expert. Right. Yeah. But then who can last 30 years? You have 30 years. I have 30 years. He has almost 30 years. Right. Yeah. You know, and so like, but who can last? Yeah. Yeah, and, and and I think that, that maybe it's a mindset shift. I, I think we're answering two different questions, but it's a mindset shift of it, now today is a college is four years, right? Yeah. And people are like, I got my college degree, and that's a big thing Still for some people, thing. right? Yeah. Master school, how, how long is doctor school, right? Like 11 years or something? Like So now you think 30 years to become, and people are like, I don't, I don't have time for 30 years. And so, <laughs> but I think if we, uh, this is just me, but, you know, how do we, how do we set more realistic milestones throughout that process and make it more, uh, 
um, more rich experience? How can we make it more rich of an experience by not just martialness, but also experiences of um, bringing different groups together to have conversations, to do these things? And how do we do that and keep people interested so that they keep going through those milestones? Because you know, if somebody lasts a month, they're probably going to be here three months. If they go three months, they might stay a year. If they stay a year, they might stay three years. But so how do we get people to those milestones more often versus just saying, now you have to be here 30 years or I, I don't feel, I'm not this, I know you're not saying this, but you're not respected. And I think sometimes it's hard for us as long-term students to say, hey, you did a really good job. You did a back roll and I really, you did great. And I tucked your chin and you got your fifth cue and, you know, whatever. We, we celebrate those things without, so that, they can continue to keep their their egos down. humbleness down and their egos down, but but we also can give them more milestones and celebrate those things. And you know, I, I, I don't know the answer, but yeah. Do you think that there is a an identity that people at some point in their training become martial artists? In your That's training, That's interesting. What's a martial art? Yeah, you're, you're, you're saying what's when? What it, is that? I I don't know that there is. I'm just curious from your perspective. When you know, as you as you train your students to, and trying to build in that that 30 year path, do some people become martial artists? Do you see that happening, or is that not something that that you? See? I, I guess that what do you define as a martial artist? But I I kind of get your your thought is that how do you get people on that path and that. From a, from a teacher to a student perspective, right. I think you have to provide the opportunity and the consistency of culture, consistency of your techniques and your expectations and your humbleness and your teach as much as we can as humans, right? And then how do we consistently then reward people for, and reward people as in, you know, maybe I might give my students more time that that are more perceptive and they're help, more helpful. Right. Maybe we have special classes or we teach them things that we don't necessarily focus on as much. And then over time, the the contract then is negotiated in the sense of that I might, this is just like my teacher, okay, I'm going to throw you around more or I'm going to bring you to other seminars or I'm going to um, give you more opportunities to learn in the depth of your training. And so... I don't know what that point is and when that happens. It's like a ding, ding, right? Like that, but you know, defining what that is, is, uh, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting thing, you know, All right? That's a good question. So how many years have you been doing Aikido now? See, 85, 30, 37, two, 37 years. Yeah. 37 like that, years. Yeah. So what do you do yeah. that other people might not know yeah. to train yourself? Well, that, uh, there was two things I was thinking about that. And like, so is it, what did I do that made me successful or do what, what I do, do right now? What do you do now that the teacher, the student has become the teacher? So you have to train yourself to keep yourself on track. What do you do that no one else knows that, what do you do, which people may not know that to train yourself? Um, my theory nowadays is that uh, there's an opportunity to learn every time I put on my uniform or even in the world, right? In, in any time there's an opportunity to do martial arts, right? And so if I go and I take the opportunity to go train with somebody, I can there, – there's got to be one thing that I can pick up that class. That's a lovely sentiment that you just told us. I don't us. know if it's possible, but it, can I do uh, that? Yeah, that is a lovely sentiment that you just told us. But we want to know what you do that no one else do, knows, which is a secret. Well, here, here's where I'm going with that. Train uh, here's where I'm going with that. So what makes me different than somebody who's been training five years? I have 30 years of experience and 30, 10,000 hours and whatever, how many times you do that. So you have, I have more opportunity to now... How do I how do I make myself better? And so my myself is how do you now take that and move into the next stage of okay when I see somebody do aikido, right? How do I steal steal their aikido? How do I how do I do that? And I, I think this is important for a martial artist, 
right? And how to how to and this is why in the old days they would never have people watch your Aikido. And the Okuden training, the special training would never be able to seen, right? Because people that are good students can say, okay, I saw what they did. And why did they hide, hide your feet in your hakama? Right? So I'm not saying this is a secret, but this is what I do as a, as a, as a, as a student of how do I get make myself better? Focus on my own fundamentals and go back to basics. And then secondly, when I go train with other people, and even when I train with my own students, like how do I pick up that one thing that then I can reassess, take that other 30x years of training and now – take that one thing I learned that night and then how do I, how do I interpret that? And how do I, how can I integrate that into it? Not necessarily take and start training my students and doing that for the next, but how do I do that with myself? Hmm. You know, and just, here's a very simple example, right? So, you know, we do tachidori, jodori all the time, right? You know, that's love doing it, especially, you know, with pandemic stuff, we can't do as much open hand stuff. So we do a lot of that, but we really enjoyed training and we went to, got to train with Azao Sensei. So Azao Sensei was doing Jodori techniques and stuff and had some really nice techniques. So again, uh, the beauty of doing something that's, is they have different experiences and they have different, and we were doing very similar style techniques, but it was such a beautiful, different directional movement of the Jo. And it was subtle, like these little things. Like I don't know if I, I don't know if I got it or I, was, I was still, you know. But there's there's something there. I was like, okay, everything doesn't have to be this line. Everything doesn't have to be this line. So how do I get better as myself? Then I then I'm I'm always then focusing on what are my lines? How are my openings? You know, how are my how are how do I refine what I'm doing to be better? I I don't know if that's perfect answer. There's no like secret techniques I go under, you know, the, the waterfall. But um, I, th- I think that's that's something that I'm trying to do, that and learning, going back to the beginning. Well, that's a good place to stop. Um, I appreciate you coming out and teaching. I appreciate you coming out and being on our podcast. Uh, you live close enough to where we could probably have you on many times. We could even dial in and have you. Yeah. on as well um, but thanks for coming thank you very much sensei and I appreciate it and uh, thank you all for watching and listening if you have any questions or comments leave them in the comment section of either this video or this podcast thank you very much thank, thank you, you.